Hungarian goulash is yet another example of a beautiful classic recipe that's died the death of a thousand cuts. Well, at least outside of Hungary. Most Americans think of goulash as a thickened gummy gravy with cheap tough meat that's dumped over boiled noodles, as in a cafeteria lunchroom. Obviously that's not why goulash became the national dish of Hungary. And true authentic goulash is not poured over pasta. A special pasta called chepetke is cooked into it, and I'll show you how to make those here. Now traditionally goulash is cooked over an open fire, but I've provided a good working solution to that. This is nothing like any goulash you have ever tasted before outside of Hungary. Paprika is the key to this dish, of course, so I'm adding about two tablespoons of hot paprika to this. One tablespoon of coarse salt. And half a tablespoon of ground black pepper. Um, just a quick mix here. Uh, this meat. <laughs> A typical Russian mystery meat. It's um, I think it came from around the ribs, but I'm not entirely sure because they don't label things here. It's just like beef, some kind of beef, <laughs> and because they they cut it up in a strange way, it, it it doesn't match any cuts. Most of the time, it doesn't match any cuts in any other part of the world. So, just looking at it, I, I think it's like some kind of short rib beef. But uh, you have to kind of judge by the fact that. The important part is that it has um, some some striations of, of fat and connective tissue in here. You don't want it too dry, and you don't want it fatty. You don't want it you don't want it soaking in in goo when it's done either. So this is absorbing almost all the paprika. This is a lot of paprika on here, as you can see. And uh, there's still some more in the bottom, but that's that's okay. Now we're gonna fry this. And once the pan is hot, I'm going to add enough oil here to cover the entire bottom of the pan. Don't worry about it because don't worry about it having too much because we're going to strain this off later anyway. The pan's heating up. I'm going to prepare the vegetables. I've got the onions and the celery here. You can cut them in large pieces because it's going to cook for a long time. And I've got uh, a whole head of garlic. I'm just going to go down in the middle right here. And uh, this is our vegetables. I'm not putting carrots in the in this. What would it's almost a mirepoix because there'll be so many carrots added later. So we're not going to. Let me go in. This is like some of the times you've seen the brown meat where we want to get it like almost black. In this case, we're looking. We want the paprika to go into the oil. And we want to make sure that there's uh, basically no bacteria alive on the outside of the meat. So I'm only really going to cook this for three or four minutes here. Because this is going to cook for a long time at a low temperature. So if we started out with meat that has bacteria on it, the whole thing will be toxic by the time we're done. So it's important to, to brown it in some oil first, kill off anything that's in there so that the, uh, the prolonged cooking time at a low temperature doesn't turn it toxic. Okay, now that this went in, actually, I'm going to onions, celery in there, along with the rest of the, the spice, and actually try. And here's the meat in the braising dish. And I'm going to put the vegetables over the top of this. And I did not put the garlic in there, so I'm going to put the garlic over here now. I'll surround the edges. Looks pretty good. And this gets sealed up and uh, start the braise. Now, because of the very long braise time, what I've done is I've taken a piece of parchment paper, baking paper, and uh, put in there as an extra layer, extra precaution to make sure steam really stays in there. Finally, after cook time is up, there we go. Meat's tender. We'll let this cool down just a little bit, then we're going to lift it out of there, uh, separate the meat from the liquid, and strain the strain the liquid off. 
And here we have the meat that's been removed. And string this into a fat separating pitcher. As you can see, there's two layers. We'll be able to pour the broth off and discard the fat. And there's the layer of fat you can see. have our uh, vegetables here we're going to use for the soup. I've cored these tomatoes, I'm going to put a little X on them and I'm going to remove the skins from these, make them into a concasse. It's not traditional, you know, Hungarians don't bother with this, but I don't, I don't like bits of tomato skin sticking in my teeth, so I'm going to get rid of them. And you should already know how to do this, but just in case, you put them in hot water for about 30 seconds and then show them in an ice bath. And here we have seconds later. Pull them out, stick them in the ice bath, and then they, they can be peeled easily up. And now we're basically ready. I've got these uh, tomatoes that are peeled. I've got a yellow bell pepper. It's important to use yellow for this. This is, this is the best kind of pepper you can get outside of Hungary for this soup. Um, some carrots, onions, um, sweet paprika. It started out with hot paprika for the meat. I'm going to use sweet paprika in, in the rest of the dish. I've got caraway seeds here. Um, I, this is in a, an unusual bottle that, that enables you to grind them up into a very fine powder. If you don't have this sort of a bottle, and you probably don't, you can use a spice grinder, but, but you'll need to grind your caraway uh, into a fine powder. And then uh, also I'm going to use uh, rendered pork fat for cooking this, which is the tr tradition in, uh, in Hungary for this dish. Uh, I know a lot of people are squeamish about using rendered fat but consider that it has uh, less saturated fat than butter and it has no trans fats. If, as long as you rendered it yourself, there's no trans fats in it at all. So it's actually healthier than butter and uh, it'll bring some taste to this dish. Okay. The pork fat is hot. I'm going to add the onions and start sauteing these for a minute before I add the paprika. Now that the onions have brought the temperature of the oil down a little bit, I'm going to add this paprika. This is best quality organic Hungarian sweet paprika. This is not the cheap stuff. This isn't the time to use cheap paprika because the flavor of this entire dish is based on the paprika. So it has to be really good quality. After about three minutes, I put the heat on six by the way out of one out of ten. So the paprika has been cooked sufficiently at this point. And now I'm going to add the tomatoes and that yellow bell pepper to that guy step. And we're going to cook this for a few minutes. I actually heated, turned up the heat a little bit to seven during this cooking time. It's been about four or five minutes now. You can see it's now dry on the bottom. Now I'm going to add the caraway to this. and. I'm adding wine to this, but I, I understand that uh, some Hungarians take exception to this and they say it shouldn't have it. You know, it's, it's the hotel chef in me. <laughs> I'm going to add um, three ounces, uh, 90 milliliters of red wine to this, and I'm going to cook it again to reduce this down to, to where it's almost a syrup before we continue. Okay, it's been four or five more minutes. And as you can see, when you, when you wipe it, it's pretty dry. That's the point we're looking for. Now, if you've tasted it up till now and you wonder, well, it doesn't have very good flavor, it doesn't have very strong flavor, it's because it's virtually no salt in this part yet. Now, I'm going to add that liquid that we strained off of the meat that was cooked. If you don't have a liter of beef stock on hand and you want to save yourself some time, use a liter of water and one of these Nor brand beef stock pot gels. Don't use canned beef stock, though. and the carrots. Now, we're going to begin simmering this on a low heat. I'm turning the heat down from 7 down to 4 and we're going to simmer this quite slowly. I'm not going to add the meat yet because the meat is already soft and very tender. In a traditional uh, normal goulash you would have the meat going in here as well because it needs a long simmering time but we already took care of that that meat is plenty tender so if I put that in now it's just going to turn into goo so we don't want to we don't want to do that we want to keep the meat as uh, pieces you can actually see and taste in it so we're just going to cook the rest of this right now cook it down yeah it, it's going to simmer for quite a while 
While the soup is simmering away, we have to make the chipetka, the traditional um, pasta that goes into it. So I've got 100 grams of flour here, and then add about half a teaspoon of salt, uh, an egg, and uh, process this to, to make it into a dough. Once the dough comes together, wrap it up with clean film, as is so often the case with those, and uh, refrigerate it for at least 15 minutes. But uh, we got plenty of time while the soup cooks. And the soup's been in there for about just over an hour now, so I'm going to start making this chipette actually about an hour and 15 minutes. So this is our dough that rested in the refrigerator. In, in Hungary, this is a, a task that children are usually given to do, so don't feel intimidated by it because um, it's really not important exactly how well you do it. Just kind of flatten it out to about uh, a centimeter or so. Um, and I'm going to put some flour on a plate here. <laughs> This is ridiculously simple, and, it, and it's not at all expected to be precise. You just tear off pieces like this to like little bean size pieces. They don't have to be exact. It's There's no right or wrong here. That's what you do. You just keep tearing off little pieces, and you fill the plate. Okay. And after <laughs> about 10 minutes, you end up with, with a plate full of these chipetka. Uh, I tell you, after you do this one time, you, you have a new appreciation for the virtues of child labor for doing this because uh, anybody can do it and it's very time consuming. Okay, now we turn our attention to the meat again. And these pieces were left to chill for several hours now in the refrigerator. Now, you know, some people like large pieces of meat in it. It's up to you. Traditionally, you want it about this size, quite small. You might end up with veins like this, of this connective tissue that's not especially soft. You know, take it off and taste it. If this isn't soft, don't use it. <laughs> Just get rid of it. You want you want this to be delicious and, and mouth-watering, not chewy and nasty. The soup has now been simmering for exactly one and a half hours. Uh, for the record, I've got 300 grams of this meat. Um, it's about uh, 11 ounces, something like that. Um, Okay, <clears throat> the uh, soup has been, uh, soup goulash, has been uh, brought back up to a simmer now uh, with a slightly higher heat. You can see the bubbles forming. Now I add the chipetka to this. Now it has to cook for about five more minutes at least for this to be, um, for these to be cooked through it and soft. But really it's better if it cooks a little bit longer. It'll help thicken it up. Um, the traditional Hungarian cooks this exactly five minutes from what I've seen and uh, and then they call it done. Uh, I like it cooked a little bit more. I want that flour to be worked through and cooked as much as possible. After about five minutes they do float to the surface and I'm going to add <coughs> a couple teaspoons of fresh herbs in here. I've got mostly parsley. Uh, there's a little bit of dill and a little bit of thyme in there. You can use what herbs you like. Um, Parsley is probably the most traditional. Dill is probably not traditional at all, but I like it in there. <laughs> so, you know, suit yourself. Um, you know, like I said, because this, these uh, have a lot of flour on them, and I don't want a raw flour taste in here, and I do want the soup to be thicker. Uh, this this goulash, you know, for Hungarians, it's like a soup for them. I like it a little bit thicker. I'm not part of that culture. So I, I'm going to let this continue to simmer for oh, maybe another uh, five or ten minutes and let it thicken up a little bit more. Also look for my cocktail book, Cocktails of the South Pacific and Beyond, Advanced Mixology, available through Amazon online.